Hello and good evening all. We are going to commence the first lecture on the series of lecture for breast cancer. And breast cancer is a bulky topic, so we intend to take various aspects as a separate lecture so that we can cover a lot of areas and discuss them in detail. For the first lecture, we are going to commence with pathology and classification of breast cancer. And the outline will commence by discussing introduction and epidemiology of breast cancer. We should know that breast cancer is the most common malignancy in women and comprises 18 to 25 percent of all female cancers and one percent in males with a male female ratio of one ratio 103 in some texts one ratio 99 and it is the commonest malignancy affecting women of course in nigeria where studies were done in Ibadan, okay, it shows it's the commonest malignancy. In Ghana, also, it accounts for 16% of all malignancy. Now, you should know that the lifetime risk of a female developing breast cancer is 8 to 12%. The lifetime risk of a female developing breast cancer is 8 to 12%. This is higher in Caucasians than in Blacks. And this incidence increases with age. Only 5% of breast cancer occur in women that are less than 40 years. Now, accounts about 14% mortality. However, patients in developing countries are more likely to die from the disease due to late presentation, lack of adequate screening and diagnostic modalities, and limitation in treatment options. So the mortality in the developing countries is higher because of these reasons that are mentioned. In developed countries where screening for early detection is commoner, as well as various treatment modalities that are readily available, the outcome of breast cancer is better. And generally among even though breast cancer is a common malignancy, you should know that it is even having a better prognosis compared to other intra-abdominal malignancies because most of these are easily detected and treated um, earlier as compared to cancers like colon cancer. Now, the risk factors for breast cancer, you should know that only 30% have well-established risk factors. 70% are idiopathic, okay, with no well-established risk factor apart from gender and age. So when you see a female um, that is more than 30 years, usually that might be the only risk factor you Will pick because majority of the risk factors are idiopathic. Now, the risk factors are categorized into major, intermediate, and minor risk factors. And this categorization is based on the increased risk associated with a particular risk factor. Now, the major risk factors for 
breast cancer are age, sex, genetic predisposition, and previous breast cancer. The intermediate factors include hormonal factors, which is prolonged exposure to estrogen, previous irradiations, benign breast diseases with atypical hyperplasia, diets, alcohol, minor risk factors include obesity, especially in the postmenopausal women and benign breast disease with mild to moderate hyperplasia. Now, the major risk factor, age. Now you should know the risk increases with advancing age, especially after the year, after 50 years. But you should know that generally, breast cancer is commoner in women more than 35 years than those less than 35 years. Now, you should know it's rare in women that are less than 20 years. Only 2% of breast cancer is, is seen in females that are less than 20 years. And this incidence rises steadily between 30 to 80 years until 80 years when it becomes flat. However, young individuals less than 45 years that develop breast cancer tend to have a more aggressive disease and are more likely to be African. Now, the reason which we will see Younger individuals are, are, tend to have more genetic predisposition, which we will see shortly. Now, what you should have in mind is this incidence for breast cancer steadily increases with age. From 30 years, it steadily increases up to the age of 80, where the risk now flattens. The higher the age, the more the risk. <clears throat> Sex. 99% of breast cancer occur in women, while men have 1%. <clears throat> higher in Caucasians than black. Even in the US, you see one in eight and one in 14 among the black population. So generally, breast cancer is commoner in Caucasians as compared to black race. Now, genetic predisposition. The genetic predisposition, hereditary breast cancer accounts, accounts five to 10% of breast cancer, okay? Now, you see, um, five to ten percent of breast cancer have a strong inherited risk due to some genetic defects, okay, inherited from parents. And mostly this genetic defect is as a result of loss or deletion of tumor suppressor genes, okay. And when these mutations occur, and they are transmitted to the next generation, they are they present with malignancy, the breast cancer. Now, such patients usually have a positive family history. Now, you, you should see generally how breast cancer are divided or classified in terms of um, percentage inheritance. Now you, you see sporadic, as we mentioned, is 70 to 85% of all breast cancer. Then the inherited type is 15 to 30%. Now, the inherited type are further categorized into two, familial breast cancer and genetic breast cancer. Now, you should know that familial breast cancer 
accounts for 10 to 20% and genetic 5 to 10%. Now, what is the difference between a familial breast cancer and genetic breast cancer? For familial breast cancer, it's a type of breast cancer that runs in the family. However, a particular gene has not been isolated as the culprit. While in genetic or hereditary, you have an isolated gene, okay, for that as the culprit for a particular cancer. Now, hereditary breast cancer is usually characterized by early age of onset, high incidence of bilateral disease, and associated with ovarian, colonic, or prostate in men. Okay, prostate cancer. Now, let us see the common genes that are um, implicated. Now, the BRCA gene or the breast-related cancer antigen or breast cancer antigen, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. BRCA is a tumor suppressor gene, okay? BRCA gene coordinates the repair of damaged DNA strand of P10. P10 is also a tumor suppressor. They elaborate tumor suppressor enzymes. So when you have mutation, in BRCA gene, the tumor suppression will be defective. Cells with BRCA mutation are not able to repair damaged P10. This allows the cells to continue uncoordinated growth and ultimately becomes malignant. Patients with BRCA mutation have 60 to 80% risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. Now, generally we said a, a woman in her lifetime have 12%, okay? Eight to 12% risk. But when this BRCA mutation is inherited, you can see how the risk multiplies. 80% of hereditary breast cancer cases have BRCA mutation, and it is inherited as autosomal dominant. It is inherited as autosomal dominant. Now, what is the location of these um, genes. Now, BRCA1 is located in the long arm of chromosome 17. It is located in the long arm of chromosome 17. Okay, region two or segment two, band one. Okay, so this is the chromosome, this is the arm, Q is the long arm, P petit is the short arm, Y2 is the region where the gene is located. This is the region or the segment. And this is, on that segment, there are various bands. And this is the band. So you should know that BRCA1 is located on the long arm of chromosome 17, segment two, band one. 65 to 85% risk for developing breast cancer. So you can see we are no longer talking about eight to 12% risk in a lifetime of a woman. We are talking about 65 to 85% risk of developing breast cancer. Okay, it predisposes to breast and prostate cancer. 
invasive ductal carcinoma, which is usually triple negative. So when you think of BRCA1, you should know that they usually correlate with breast cancers that are triple negative, which are even more aggressive. Such tumors are thus high grade, more aggressive with poorer prognosis. 50% risk of developing bilateral cancers. Now, BRCA2 is located also on the long arm of chromosome 13, segment one, band two. 40 to 85% risk of breast cancer as compared to the 12 percent in the general population. Now you can see a series, several carcinomas, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, and breast cancer are related to this. Now, breast cancer, especially male breast cancer, bilateral breast cancer in both sex. Now, BRCA2 is also associated with male breast cancer. The breast cancer it causes are well differentiated and ER positive as compared to BRCA1. So you should know that BRCA1 are commonly associated with triple negative breast cancer while BRCA2 are usually ER positive, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. But generally, you should know they have tendency for bilaterality. They have tendency to occur in younger individuals. They have tendency to have present with multiple cancers and they are more aggressive, even though the BRCA1 tends to be more aggressive as compared to the BRCA2 carcinomas. Now, family history. 15% of breast cancer patients have a positive family history. There is no family history in the remaining 85% of cases. Okay, patients with first degree relative, okay, with breast cancer, that is, grandmother, mother, sister, or daughter. First degree relatives are those you share 50% of your genetic makeup. Those are your first degree relatives, okay? They have two to three times, they have two to three times, okay, risk of developing breast cancer. If an individual have a family history of breast cancer, in her first degree relative, maybe her mother or the mother, her daughter, that first degree relative have a risk that is what two to three times more than that of the general population. So we are not talking about eight to 12 percent risk in her lifetime. That eight to 12 percent will increase by three. Okay. Risk is much higher if affected first degree relative had premenopausal onset and bilateral cancers. When we discuss the prevention of breast cancer, you see the significance of this, where you see women with family history in first degree relative and after genetic screening are positive for that mutation. They have prophylactic mastectomy 10 years earlier than the age at which that first degree relative will uh, develop the cancer. Risk decreases quickly in women with distant relatives affected with breast cancer, like cousins and grandmother. Now, the positive family history may be familial or hereditary. We have differentiated 
we have differentiated familial breast cancers from hereditary breast cancers, okay? Okay. Previous breast cancer is a risk for developing breast cancer. Breast cancer in contralateral breast, okay, is associated with 16 times increased risk. 16 times increased risk. 6% of all patients with breast cancer have, okay, have had treatment for breast cancer and contralateral breast, okay? So if a patient have previous breast cancer, the risk of developing breast cancer in the contralateral breast increased by 16 times, okay? Now, 6% of all those patients who have breast cancer have had treatment for breast cancer in the contralateral breast. Now, fibroadenosis with atypical hyperplasia is also a previous benign breast disease with um, increased risk of developing cancer. Now you should know that benign breast diseases, benign breast diseases, not all benign breast diseases have risk for developing breast cancer. It is those benign breast diseases with atypical hyperplasia. It's those benign breast diseases with atypical hyperplasia that have tendencies for developing breast cancer. Fibroadenoma is not a risk for developing breast cancer. The risk in fibroadenoma is less than 0.1%. It's less than 0.1%. So if you have a simple fibroadenoma, that is less than three centimeters in a patient that is less than 30 years, of course, you can do a non-operative management for such patient because 10 to 40 percent, 10 to 40 percent of such fibroadenomas will regress spontaneously. And if a patient is less than 30 years, of course, the breast board is still developing. It is when a woman reaches 30 years that the breast board have, are fully developed. So if you have a tiny fibroadenoma, less than two centimeters, less than three centimeters in a patient. You look laughing at your hand work. In a patient that is um, less than 30 years, okay, you can actually do a non-operative uh, management by observation, okay? Now, this just by the way, you should know that benign breast diseases with atypical hyperplasia are the lesions, are the benign lesions with increased risk for transformation. That's why if you are taking history uh, from a patient with breast cancer and she tells you that she has this breast lump that has been present for some time. It has been there for like five years. And recently in the past six months, in the past one year, it started increasing in size rapidly. So of course you start suspecting it has undergone, okay, malignant transformation. You have to biopsy that uh, lesion. 15 and 16% of patients who survive 20 and 30 years respectively after treatment of breast cancer develop cancer in the contralateral breast. So you can see treating breast cancer in one breast is a risk factor for developing in the contralateral breast. Even papillomas, okay, ductal papillomas, with atypical hyperplasia. When you excise a ductal papilloma, okay, with atypical hyperplasia, some are just normal papilloma without atypia, okay? It is the type with atypia that have higher risk of malignant transformation. 
Patients who have had cancer of the ovary, uterus, bowel, prostate, and soft tissue sarcomas have a double risk of developing breast cancer in the future due to BRCA mutation. Now, you should know that not that there are no other malignant, uh, other mutations that um, predispose predisposes, but you can see BRCA is the most important um, gene mutation that we highlighted. Even though when you check your text, you see some other syndromes that are also associated with breast cancer. Ovarian and uterine cancer also share the risk factor of chronic estrogen exposure with breast cancer. Now, prolonged exposure to estrogen. From our classification of the risk factors, you can see this is an intermediate risk, okay? This is an intermediate risk because the risk is less than the, those factors with um, high, high risk factor, okay? Now, early menarche and late menopause. Early menarche before is defined as menarche before the age of 12 years. A late menopause beyond 55 years, okay, has one and a half, okay, one and a half times greater. You can see the risk is not as high as those genetic factors we mentioned. That's why it is categorized as an intermediate risk. So you can see this is one and a half times, okay, than those with menarche at normal age or menopause by 45 years. Age at first pregnancy. Those having first child less than 18 years have less risk compared to those who have at average age of 24 years. This risk triples if the first pregnancy is more than 35 years. This is very important, okay? The risk triples if the first pregnancy is greater than 35 years. Nulliparity or low parity. This associated with increased risk. Unmarried nulliparous women have a greater risk than those who are married. Each child births. So this is also very important to know that each childbed reduces the risk by 7% per childbed. The risk is triple in nulliparous women. Breastfeeding is protective. You should know that prolonged breastfeeding, okay, is protective. Short duration of breastfeeding is a risk factor. Any breastfeeding that is less than one year is regarded as short duration of breastfeeding. Averagely, in the tropical regions in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you see women averagely they breastfeed their children for 18 months. Okay, some up to two years. So this is usually protective, okay? But any breastfeeding that is less than one year is regarded as short duration of breastfeeding and it's a risk factor. Breastfeeding, okay, reduces the risk by 4.3% per breastfed per breastfed year. Hormonal contraceptives and hormone replacement therapy. Now, what type of hormonal contraceptives are we talking about here? Is estrogen containing oral contraceptives? Estrogen containing oral contraceptives, they increase the risk for developing breast cancer and hormone replacement therapy. Because some women at the menopausal period 
because of the symptoms of menopause, they take hormone replacements, and these hormone replacements are estrogen, and they tend to increase risk of both um, breast as well as ovarian cancer if they are used for more than five years. This risk disappear five to 10 years after cessation of hormone replacement therapy. Now exposure to radiation. Previous irradiation exposure to the chest is a risk, is an increased risk for breast cancer. Now this risk is higher in women that are less than 30 years, as we mentioned that the breast still have some developing breast boards. And when these developing breast boards are interfered by external radiation, they may undergo some transformation, okay? They might acquire some mutation and so on. This is seen in women commonly who had treatment for lymphomas, mantle radiation, okay? They have treatment of lymphomas of the head and neck region. And that type of radiation, the mantle radiation can predispose women, okay? The younger the individual, the higher the risk of developing breast cancer in future when they are exposed to irradiation. Now, diet and social habits, smoking. Now, smoking, cigarette smoke, okay, contains a lot of carcinogens. You can see more than 70 carcinogens, such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like benzopyrenes and others have been isolated in cigarette smoking. And you can see nicotine is addictive. And you'll be surprised to know that just a stick of cigarettes can cause vasoconstriction as long as 90 minutes, okay? And this will adversely affect uh, wound healing also. It's also negative effect of tobacco. Now, hydrogen cyanide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, ammonia, these are a lot of compounds that are contained in, in cigarette, cigarette smoking. The carcinogens directly damage DNA and cause mutation in cell repair genes such as P53, okay? P53 is also a tumor suppressor gene and you can see the carcinogens that are produced from, from cigarette smoking suppresses the P53. Susceptible individuals have a genetic defect with inability to toxify the carcinogens in cigarette smoking. The risk is higher in premenopausal women. Now, alcohol. Alcohol causes increased androgen and estrogen level and we, uh, we have seen that prolonged exposure to estrogen is a risk factor. It enhances mammary gland susceptibility to carcinogens, can act as a carcinogen, thereby causing increased mammary DNA damage and increasing the metastatic potential of breast cancer cells. They act as carcinogens via various mechanisms, okay? Ethanol is metabolized, okay, by acetaldehyde in the liver and acetaldehyde is mutagenic. Induction of CYP2E1, nutritional deficiency, impairment of retinoic acid metabolism. Now, obesity, you should know that obesity is a risk factor only in postmenopausal. Okay. It's not a risk factor in the premenopausal period. However, most of the premenopausal obese women 
carry their obesity into the post -menop the, the, the menopausal period, except those women who undergo weight reduction before their menopause, the risk from obesity will be eliminated. But usually in the premenopausal women, studies show that there is no correlation between obesity, okay, pre, in the premenopausal period and breast cancer. The correlation from studies only showed that overweight women and obese women have higher risk of breast cancer in the postmenopausal period, okay? And this is due to increased insulin level in uh, obese individual and increased aromatization of fat and steroids into estrogen. So we've talked about the risk factors and remember, to summarize the risk factors, we classify the risk factors into three, the major risk factors, the intermediate risk factors, as well as the minor risk factors. Now we will discuss on the pathology. We'll discuss on the pathology of <clears throat> breast cancer. Now, generally breast cancers are classified into two types, non-invasive carcinomas and invasive carcinomas. When you say non-invasive, it is in-situ carcinomas. The cells, the malignant cells are limited within the basement membrane. They have not crossed the basement membrane. However, they have features of malignancy in these cells. Now, you should know the difference between benign and malignant is tissue invasion. And this tissue invasion begins with break or breach of the <clears throat> basement membrane. Any lesion that bridges the basement membrane is not a benign lesion, it's a malignant lesion. Institute carcinomas, they have features of malignant cells, but they are still limited within the basement membrane. That's why they are classified as non-invasive carcinoma or carcinoma in situ. And they are further classified based on the origin of the, the cells, whether they are from the lobular tissue or from the ductile tissue. So it could either be what? lobular carcinoma institute or ductile carcinoma institute. Now, invasive carcinoma, okay, there is tissue invasion. It could either be lobular, invasive lobular carcinoma or invasive ductile carcinoma. And grossly, when you look at tumors, 90% of invasive carcinomas are skiros. They are tough and gritty. Okay. And in our environment, elderly women with skiros carcinomas, you see a lot of elderly women with skiros carcinomas, and the spread is slow because the, the malignant cells are all surrounded by fibrous tissue, tissue fibrosis, which is tough and gritty. So 90% of most of the invasive carcinomas as kiros in nature, while 6% are soft, composed of cancer cells with little stroma and mostly anaplastic, okay? Then 4% shows cellular differentiation. You see some specific types of differentiation in the cancers, but you should know that majority of these carcinomas are invasive carcinomas. Now, let us see the various types and see the characteristic feature of each of these um, cancers. Now, the non-invasive carcinomas, as we said, could be lobular carcinoma in situ. They account for two to five percent. Doctal carcinoma institute, 
or intraductal carcinomas, they are five to 10%, and there are two types. They are the non comedo type, which is less aggressive, and the comedo type, which we will see shortly. Now, the invasive carcinomas could either be invasive lobular carcinomas or the invasive ductal carcinomas. Now, most of the differential type, the ones with tissue differentiation are the invasive ductal carcinoma. But you should know majority of the invasive ductal carcinoma are non-otherwise specific or non-specified type. That means there are no differentiate, they are no, they are not differentiated into the any of these various types because differential type, as we saw in the previous slide, just accounts for about four percent. Okay. Now, invasive ductal carcinomas are further categorized into invasive ductal carcinoma non otherwise specified, which is 50 to 70 percent of invasive carcinomas. It could be tubular carcinomas, two to three percent, mucinous or colloid carcinomas, two to three percent, medullary carcinomas. 4%, papillary carcinomas, 1% to 2%, Paget disease of the nipple, 2%, inflammatory breast cancer, which is the most aggressive type of breast cancer. Don't forget, inflammatory breast cancer is the most aggressive type. Then there are some rare types of cancers like adenoid cystic carcinoma, aprocrine or squamous cell. You can have a mixed connective tissue or an epithelial tumors like the phylloidous tumors, angiosarcomas, cas um, carcinosarcomas, and um, adenocarcinomas. Now, you should know the difference between carcinomas and sarcomas. Cancers is a broad term for both carcinomas. and sarcomas. Carcinomas, like all these type you see here, they arise from the epithelial tissue. While the sarcomas, these ones, they arise from the mesenchymal tissue. So when you say carcinoma, it's a type of cancer that arises from epithelial tissue. They are epithelial in origin why sarcomas are mesenchymal in origin. And you should know that sarcomas do not spread through lymphatics. They commonly have hematogenous spread. Now let us see the first type, which is the non-invasive categories. Now let's see the lobular carcinoma in situ. Now, lobular carcinoma in situ originates from the terminal duct lobule unit and develops only in the female breasts. It is multifocal and bilateral. Now it should interest you that when you see a lobular carcinoma in situ, they can appear as what? Mirror image in the contralateral breast. Meaning when you see a lobular carcinoma in, if you see a lobular carcinoma in one breast, okay, you can have a mirror image in the contralateral breast in the same quadrant. So they could be uh, multifocal and bilateral. Now, what, when you say multifocal, what does it mean? Okay, the, you should understand these terms, multifocal and multicentric. Okay, if you have, let's say this is a breast, nipple areola, and you have the quadrant. Okay, let's say this is the upper, outer quadrant. Okay. Upper, inner quadrant. Lower, outer quadrant. 
lower inner quadrants this is the central so when you have multiple lesions in the same quadrant is termed multifocal where you have multiple lesions in different quadrant is termed multicentric you will see the significance of this when we talk about the treatment of breast cancer now predominantly premenopausal with average age of 45 years rarely okay rarely metastasize and is not okay it's not palpable invasive cancer develops in 25 to 35 percent of patients which may develop in either breast regardless of the breast okay harbors the double carcinoma institute and is detected synchronously in five percent of cases it has no mammographic feature no calcification unlike dr carcinoma institute this is because of your mcq you should know that lobular carcinoma institute have no calcification on mammography discovered by chance from biopsy from other purpose it's rarely expressed the CERB2 oncogene that is a HER2 new okay receptor they rarely express that unlike the ductal carcinoma institute lobular carcinoma institute is not directly considered as a form of cancer but is a risk factor for invasive carcinoma. It's a risk factor for transforming into invasive carcinoma, but it's on its own, it's not considered as a form of cancer. 65% of the subsequent carcinomas are ductile and hence not an anatomical precursor. Now, the ductal carcinoma institute of the institute carcinoma, this one is more important. Okay, this is more important. Doctor Carcinoma Institute, also termed as intradoctor. Okay, they form 75% of in situ carcinoma. In Doctor Carcinoma Institute, okay, malignant breast epithelial cells are confined to the duct system and does not invade the basement membrane or surrounding tissue as we mentioned earlier if untreated please notice if untreated 50 to 60 percent progresses to invasive carcinoma okay over the course of 40 years what are the types now it's important you know the various types because of difference in prognosis it's important you know the types because of difference in prognosis the two types are non-comedo type and the comedo type the doctor carcinoma institute the non-comedo type could be solid cribiform or papillary the solid the ducts filled malignant cells the cribriform has a sieve like appearance and the papillary has papillary projections the comedo type has central necrosis in the lesion comedo carcinoma is the most likely to become invasive and has the greatest expression of both dna and haploidy and her two new ce rb2 oncogene and may show calcifications unlike the lobular carcinoma that do not show calcification on mammography another subtype of invasive is another subtype of invasive is the um paget disease okay paget disease of the nipple paget disease of the nipple 
most of these patients are more than 50 years of age. Most of these patients are more than 50 years of age. It is ductal carcinoma in situ with eczema-like skin changes affecting the nipple, okay? The nipple areola and surrounding skin. So the Paget disease of the nipple will appear as an eczema. It looks like an eczema of the nipple areola complex. However, it, is, it differs from eczema in that you see one, it is unilateral, okay, while eczema usually bilateral, okay, not, uh, this is usually not during breastfeeding, eczema might be seen during breastfeeding, and 50% of carcinoma, in, uh, doctor carcinoma, Paget disease, Paget disease of the nipple, 50% are associated with a lump, a palpable lump. Why eczema is not associated with a lump? Eczema will respond to topical treatment, while Paget disease of the nipple will not respond to topical treatment. So you should know the various differences between um, Paget disease of the nipple and eczema of the nipple is a common question that you may be asked, okay? Okay, it results from ductal carcinoma institute that spreads within the duct and reaches the epidermis of the nipple, areola, and surrounding skin with resultant inflammatory reaction, crusting, and scaling. Okay, the pathology shows Paget cells, which are large irregular malignant cells, and is usually associated with underlying breast um, cancer. Okay. Now, this medullary carcinoma is also a differential type. Now, it's a special type of breast cancer, account for 4% of all invasive breast cancer. And look at, it is frequently phenotype of BRCA hereditary breast cancer, okay? Grossly, the cancer is soft and hemorrhagic. It contains malignant cells with dispersed lymphocytes large pleomorphic nuclei that are poorly differentiated and show active mitosis. Women with this cancer have a better five-year survival rate than those with non-specific type or invasive lobular carcinoma. So this is one of the differentiated breast cancer with better five-year survival. So it has a better prognosis. However, there is a variant type that is very aggressive. Approximately 50% of these cancers are associated with ductal carcinoma in situ. There is a, a medullary variant that is triple negative and is very aggressive, okay? And they are termed the basal-like breast C. <clears throat> Mucinous carcinomas. Mucinous carcinomas. Now, one typical uh, thing you know about this mucinous carcinoma is serous discharge. When we come to diagnosis, we describe the various presentation. Usually, in invasive intraductal carcinoma or invasive ductal carcinoma present with bloody nipple discharge. But you see, mucinous carcinoma will present with a serous nipple discharge. So when it's not only bloody nipple discharge that suggests, okay, carcinoma, even if you see a serous nipple discharge, you should take that seriously. Mucinous carcinoma or colloid carcinoma, okay, another special type of breast cancer, it accounts for 2% of all invasive breast cancer and typically present in the elderly population, okay, as a bulky tumor. This cancer is defined by 
extracellular pool of mucin, which surrounds, okay, which surrounds aggregates of low-grade cancer cells. The cut surface of this cancer is glistening and gelatinous in quality. Okay, fibrosis is variable, and when abundant, it impacts in in farm consistency to the cancer. Over 90% of the mucin, mucinous carcinoma display hormonal receptor. Now, these are some certain features that makes it to have a better prognosis, okay? One, they display receptor status. Two, they have a lot of mucin that okay, that surrounds the malignant cells. Lymph node metastasis occurs in 33% of cases and five to 10 years survival rate is 73% and 59% respectively. Because of the mucinous component, cancer cell may not be evident in all microscopic se sections and analysis of multiple sections is essential to confirm the diagnosis of mucinous carcinoma. So these even have a risk of presenting with a diagnostic dilemma. Because of this large amount of mucin, you go and the section, they are only seeing mucinous uh, section without malignant cells. Now, this is very important, inflammatory breast cancer. This is very important, inflammatory breast cancer. Why is the most aggressive type of breast cancer, okay? Is the most aggressive type of carcinoma of the breast. It accounts to, for about 2%, okay? It is common in lactating women or pregnancy. So inflammatory breast cancer, can be seen during pregnancy or during lactation because pregnancy associated breast cancer are seen during pregnancy or up to one year after delivery during lactation. It mimics acute mastitis because of its short duration, pain, warmth, and tenderness. So, any patient who present with mastitis during lactation, please, you, you should take it seriously. And that patient must be reviewed by a specialist. Any patient presenting with mastitis during lactation. Yeah, I, I also saw it from my own cyber's point of view. I tell you, it's not you that tell me. Yeah, because if we look at it, something wrong. It's been like, I'm sorry. So sorry, my brother. I was cutting at you. Have you? We have interference from the audience, so you can let me mute everyone. Okay. It mimics acute mastitis because of its short duration, pain, warmth, and tenderness. Clinically, it is a rapidly progressive tumor of short duration, diffuse, painful, okay? Warm, often involving the whole breast tissue with occurrence of pudorange, often extending to the skin, of the chest wall also. Now, please, you should know, not all breast cancers will present as a lump in the breast. You might see breast cancer presenting with a global involvement of the breast. The entire breast is involved and there is no palpable lump per se, okay? So, this is a way inflammatory breast cancers present and they have features of inflammation. 
How is it defined? When you see inflammatory breast cancer more than more than one third, more than one third of the skin over the breast is involved. You see features of inflammation involving more than one third of the breast. You have diffuse lymphedema, okay? Due to tumor emboli within the dermal lymphatics. Underlying localized palpable mass is not evident clinically. Underlying palpable mass is not evident clinically. It should be differentiated from, okay, locally advanced breast cancer with skin involvement where underlying palpable mass is well evident. Mammography may not show any finding except skin thickening. Inflammatory carcinoma of the breast is a clinical diagnosis. Inflammatory carcinoma of the breast is a clinical diagnosis. Ductal allobular type, okay, with cancer cell, with cancer cells in the dermal lymphatics is the histology. It is rapidly metastasized to the chest wall, bone, and lungs, okay? It is always stage 3B. Most of the time when you see them, it's already an advanced malignancy. When you see a, an inflammatory breast cancer, they're already involving the skin, okay? It's already 4D, T4D. Now, fine needle aspiration cytology confirms the diagnosis. It contains undifferentiated cells. However, these have a low sensitivity. Punch biopsy is ideal and better, which shows undifferentiated cells. Total count is normal. It's not showing you any inflammation, unlike you see in mastitis, okay, where you see total elevated white blood cell count. Now, most of the time, if you don't get biopsy, you have if you don't get a diagnosis, you have to resort to an incisional bias. We'll discuss this later during diagnosis. Now, we have seen basically the two classifications of breast cancers, the non-invasive types that are the in-situ carcinoma, then the invasive types, okay? Now, We will proceed to grading of cancers. Okay, the grading, the grading for breast cancer. The tumor grade shows the level of differentiation, whether a tumor is well differentiated, moderately differentiated, and or poorly differentiated. Tumor grades refer to the measure of similarity of the tumor to the normal breast tissue. When you say a, a tumor is 
highly differentiated, okay? It means the, it has closer similarity to the normal tissue. When it is poorly differentiated, okay, or undifferentiated, its similarity to the normal tissue, um, there is marked difference, okay, in similarity to the normal tissue. Now, the common grading that is used is the SBR grading. The Scarf, Bloom and Richardson grading system. And each is given a score between one to three. The scores are added up to have a maximum of nine and a minimum of three to give a Bloom Richardson grade. The parameters that are used are tubular formation, nuclear pleomorphism, and mitotic counts. Now the tubular formation is graded one to three. One, tubular formation in more than 75% of the tumor. Two, tubular formation in 10 to 75% of the tumor. Then three, tubular formation in less than 10% of the tumor. Then two, the other parameter is the nuclear pleomorphism. That is a variation in size, shape, and staining intensity of the nuclei, okay? When it is one nuclear with minimal variation in size and shape, two, moderate variation in size and shape of the nuclei, and three, marked variation in size and shape of the nuclei. Then mitotic count, one is less than six per high power field, two is seven to 15, and three is greater than 15. So the grading is one to three. Grade one tumors are well differentiated tumors and you have the score falling between three to five. Then grade two, grade two is moderately differentiated tumor when it falls between um, six to uh, seven. And grade three is poor, poorly differentiated tumor, which are between eight to nine. And you should know the higher the grade, the more aggressive, okay? The higher the grade, okay? The poorer prognosis. Okay, and the more tendency to spread, the more tendency to spread. And conversely, you should know that the higher the grade, the increased response to chemotherapy. Okay, the lower the grade, the less likely they respond to chemotherapy. So these have, okay, the higher grade have high response to chemotherapy. However, they have, they are more aggressive, more tendency to spread, while these have better prognosis, but their response to chemotherapy is lower. Now, this is a prognostic index, Nottingham prognostic index used in assessing prognosis of breast cancer. Okay, and it has an index or a formula you use 0.2 times size of a tumor plus the lymph node, okay, stage plus the tumor grade. You add this to calculate a patient's Nottingham prognostic index score. When the score is less than 3.4, it has a good prognosis with 80% survival in 15 years. When it is 3.4 to 5.4, it has moderate prognosis with 40% survival and greater than five, you have 15% survival. So now the staging, the staging, this is a clinical staging for breast cancer. You should know the TNM is used for clinical staging. The T is for the tumor N lymph node and M metastasis. 
it is important after you have taken a history and examine a patient with breast cancer, you should outline the clinical stage of that patient. And to outline the clinical stage of that patient, you need to be conversant with the TNM staging, okay? For the T, TX, primary tumor cannot be assessed. TIS, okay, lobular carcinoma institute, doctor carcinoma institute, hazard disease of the nipple without underlying mass. T not no clinical palpable tumor. It is a screen detected tumor. T1 tumors are less than two centimeters and there are four categories of T1 tumors. The T1 MIC, that is with micrometastasis, is tumor that is less than 0.1 centimeters. T1A is tumor between 0.1 to 0.5 centimeters. T1B, the tumor is between 0.5 to 1 centimeters. And T1C, the tumor is between 1 to 2 centimeters. Okay? T2 tumors are between 2 to 5 centimeters. Okay? T3 tumors are greater than 5 centimeters. Based on this alone, you can categorize a tumor as a local tumor. So you should know any tumor by size alone that is more than five centimeters is already regarded as a locally advanced tumor. By the way, locally advanced tumors are either tumors more than five centimeters, tumors that have involved the skin or tumors that have involved the axillary lymph nodes. So, T4 tumors of any size, okay, weight, you have four categories here. T4A, involvement of underlying chest wall, okay, while sparing pectoralis major. So if a tumor involves pectoralis major, okay, forget about it, it's not, a, it's not involving the chest wall because during surgery, you can excise, excise that muscle. T4B, skin involvement, any form of skin involvement, whether pedirange, nipple retraction, ulceration, cancer and crusade, all these are T4B. T4C is combination of T4A and T4B, okay? T4D is inflammatory breast cancer. That's why we said inflammatory breast cancer at presentation is already a locally advanced tumor, okay? Because you can see uh, for locally advanced, T4 is a locally advanced tumor. This is for nodal metastasis. NX, regional lymph node cannot be assessed. N0, N0, no clinical palpable regional lymph node involvement. Okay? Okay, N1 plus isolated tumor. Okay? ITC, small cluster of tumor less than 2 millimeters. Okay? Let's go to N1, mobile ipsilateral lymph node. So when you palpate the axilla, you feel a solitary lymph node that is mobile discrete, ipsilateral, that is on the same side with the tumor, is an N1 tumor. N2 has A and B. When it is matted, ipsilateral axillary nodes is N2A. N2B, there is internal mammary node in the absence of axillary lymph node. Then N3, a infraclavicular lymph node, which or without axillary lymph node. 3B, both ipsilateral axillary and internal mammary node. And N3C is supraclavicular lymph node involvement. MX, metastasis cannot be assessed. M1, no distant metastasis. M2, distant metastasis present. Okay. Now, the last section. Okay, this is an old staging system. Of course, some old examiners will still 
ask a candidate of the Manchester staging just to um, destabilize a candidate. They might just ask you, what is the Manchester staging? Even though this is an old and obsolete staging, but it is expected that every re resident doctor should have an idea on the Manchester staging. So lastly, the last segment of today's lecture is going to be on the spread of breast cancer. The spread of breast cancer could either be local invasion, through lymphatics or through bloodstream. You should know the commonest sites of metastasis, the commonest site of metastasis of breast cancer is to the bones. The commonest site of metastasis of breast cancer is spread to the bone via hematogenous. Now, let us see local invasion. It affects surrounding breast tissue, underlying skin, underlying muscle and chest wall. It occurs via direct infiltration into the surrounding parenchyma, causes macroscopic stellate appearance, direct infiltration along the lactiferous duct leading to nipple retraction. Involvement of the ligament of Ashley Cooper leading to what? Dimpling of the skin. Local spread within the breast leads to multifocality, okay? Other cancer within the same quadrant as the primary tumor. We've defined this earlier. It is, a pre it is present in up to 50% of patients with breast cancer. It extends or its extent depends on tumor size. It accounts for the unaccept unacceptable high incidence of local recurrence. If breast, conservative, breast conservation is performed without adjuvant radiotherapy. Now, multicentricity, other carcinoma outside the quadrant containing the primary tumor. So you see in the same breast, but in a different quadrant. Skin involvement leads to skin tethering. Okay, skin attachment, pudorant obstruction of dermal lymphatics or ulceration. Now lymphatic system. Now it involves axillary 75% or internal mammary lymph node 25%. Spread to axillary lymph node is the most important. Please don't forget this. Axillary lymph node import, uh, involvement is the most prognostic, important prognostic indicator of breast cancer. So those without axillary lymph node have better prognosis as compared to those with axillary lymph node because if this tumor already involved the axillary lymph node, it's already an advanced malignancy. Because advanced malignancy are, for, are classified into two. It's either a locally advanced breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer. So breast cancer that involve the axillary lymph node or skin or the size is more than five centimeters is a locally advanced breast cancer. While metastatic breast cancer involve distant structures. Tumors in the inner breast quadrant and periareolar tumor have higher incidence of internal mammary involvement. Routine excision of internal mammary node in breast cancer patient has not been associated with an overall improvement in survival. So there is no need to be uh, being too aggressive or doing mutilating surgeries for breast cancer because the overall, um, the overall outcome shows no any significant difference. The size of the primary breast cancer is the, the size of the primary breast cancer is the most important determinant of lymph node spread. The, the larger the size, the more tendency to spread. Uh, to spread to the lymph node. Metastasis, as a rule, okay, have their origin in the primary tumor 
are not from other metastases. However, spread is from one lymph node to another, okay? Or less obstruction of the lymph node flow by the tumor cause directional change. This is the basis for sentinel lymph node biopsy technique, okay? Now, you should know even there's the Fisher's theory that says uh, breast cancer ab initio at presentation is a systemic disease, okay? It's even spread, it can spread via hematogenous. That's why systemic treatment cannot be ruled out in breast cancer management, okay? You have to carefully evaluate and ensure a patient merits the indication for giving a systemic treatment. You shouldn't, breast cancer, please, as a rule, we'll discuss that in the treatment, as a rule, management of breast cancer is multidisciplinary. Do not manage breast cancer, okay, in isolation. It has several specialists. You have to involve other specialists. Metastasis, okay, we've mentioned that. Lymph node spread may also lead to some skin changes. We've mentioned all this, okay? Spread by bloodstream. Spread to distant sites through the bloodstream, such as the lungs, liver, bones, brain, and the peritoneum. Invasive lobular carcinoma and signet ring ductal carcinoma have high incidence of metastasis to the peritoneum, okay? The commonest site of metastasis of breast cancer, as we mentioned, is to the bones. You should know that a category or a variety that is called the triple negative breast cancer metastasize commonly to viscera, unlike other invasive carcinomas. Triple negative breast cancer, their common site of metastasis is to the body viscera, okay? They metastasize to the brain, lungs, the peritoneum unlike other forms that metastasize to the bone. So we are going to stop here for today's um, first um, series, the first lecture of the series of breast cancer. So um, we are going to entertain questions, okay? And answer, I'm going to allow you unmute yourself if you have any question, okay? You can unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Thank you very much for participating.